Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the, this evening's uh, discussion. Um, uh, my name is Richard Hornsey. I'm the Dean of the Lausanne School of Engineering at York University, uh, and I welcome you all here tonight. Um, I will go, going to say something I don't often say, which is apologies for the lineup to get in. It doesn't often happen at our events. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome you to The Ghost in the Machine, which is a, a public debate on technology, artificial intelligence, uh, regulation, ethics, the future, all of these things. So everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, uh, whether it's a fantasy of a better world ahead, whether it's a, a fantasy of the end of the world, uh, whether it's alarmism or merely, in, in often in our case in the university, very detailed uh, technical research. You can't avoid uh, the fact of machine learning, artificial intelligence and big data, and they're gonna change our worlds. Uh, we already see it through uh, social media and the big IT companies. Um, and there's so much information out there. It's really hard to tell what's accurate, uh, what's uh, clickbait to get you to, to, to click on ads, um, and what's alarmism and speculation. So uh, we invited to resolve and help us through this the talented, multifaceted uh, panel that we have in front of us today. Um, and they're going to debate the difficult issues around artificial intelligence uh, and ask, answer uh, questions from the audience uh, towards the end. So, uh, where are we now? Where will we, where, will, where will we be in 10, 20, 100 years from now? And that's the goal of the next 100 series of, uh, of uh, events. This is the second of three. Uh, the first one was on the future of education. This one's on the future of artificial intelligence. So, at the Lausanne School of Engineering, uh, we talk about using science and technology uh, to change the world for the better. We firmly believe our students and researchers have the, the power and the role and the education uh, to do just that. But we also believe in that we should take responsibility for our actions uh, as engineers, as scientists and technologists, um, because they're unleashed on the world in that, in that way. So we know that knowledge and innovation um, have a wider array of consequences, and that's the sort of thing that we're trying to navigate through uh, this evening. So this event, as I mentioned, is the second in the series. Um, and uh, about how technology is changing the future. The, the next one will be on uh, technology and en uh, entertainment uh, coming up in a, in a few months' time. So uh, before I introduce the moderator for tonight's discussion, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Jane Yordikieva, who's the, uh, conceived of this event, and, uh, or the series, and uh, organized tonight's event. So thank you, Jane, wherever you are in the, in the, in the crowd. And uh, first, I'd like to, I'm standing right in front of him so you can't see, uh, welcome Jesse Hirsch, uh, who's the moderator uh, for tonight's panel. Jesse is a broadcaster, researcher, artist, public speaker, uh, and you may recognize his name and his voice, uh, if not his face, from, from CBC Radio uh, and uh, also TVO. So uh, his research interests are the intersection of technology and politics, and in particular, the artificial intelligence and democracy. So, under his guidance, let the debate begin. Thank you very much. And I would also uh, begin by saying that we very much welcome your participation, both via the Slido uh, website, which allows you to add questions, but also, of course, via Twitter. And for those of you just entering, there's uh, four or five seats in the first or second row so I certainly encourage those of you who uh, are keen enough to come on up and join us. I've been asked to introduce the people on the panel, and I would point out that while this is a debate, there are no clear sides in that really we're all trying to figure out where we are in this black box, the extent to which we are cyborgs, the extent to which AI has reached sentience and is listening to us intently now, but nonetheless, we want to flesh out disagreement, we want to flesh out contention. And one of the things I've asked or encouraged our panel to do is to sometimes say things that they do not necessarily agree with, but that they believe should be said. And further, I would also say to you, the audience, that I will recognize what I call the Arnold Horshack principle. 
the Arnold Horshack principle is that if you really, really need to say a question and you can use nonverbal language in such a way as to get the room's attention, you will certainly have an opportunity to speak to the mic. Those of you who are not aware of who Arnold Horshack is, I certainly encourage you to Google it. But now let us uh, uh, introduce our lovely panel who on stage right, coincidentally, we have our representatives of industry with Huda Idris, who is uh, from Dot Health and who uh, has extensive experience in the startup community. And of course, Steve Irvine, who is in the AI industry, currently the CEO of Integrate.ai, but has experience in places like Facebook and other realms of the AI domain. Now, both of whom have very extensive biographies that you can read in this pamphlet, and I certainly encourage you to familiarize yourselves with their Twitter handles so that you can be able to quote them or yell at them on Twitter as the evening goes by. <laughs> on stage left, we have our academic friends who are representing perhaps a more research-centric or intellectual approach to the issues we're saying today, but not necessarily because Ian Kerr, of course, has brought his fighting t-shirt, so he's ready to rumble. And of course, Ian is the Canada Research Chair in Ethics, Law, and Technology at the University of Ottawa, and actually one of the co-founders of the We Robot Conference, which deals with much of the subject matter we touch upon today, so I encourage you to Google that after as well. And then, of course, Regina Reini who is an assistant professor of philosophy at York University and a core member of the Vision Science Applications Research Program. But again, I certainly encourage our industry friends to be as theoretical and abstract as possible, same way I encourage our academic friends to talk about some of the they see in industry and what we'll all see in politics. Now, we've decided to break tonight into three themes, with the first being status update, where are we? What's going on? What's the state of now? The second being the future with the status quo. So what will the future be like if we do nothing and just hold the course as it is? And then finally, utopia or dystopia or black mirror, which is we will all take the opportunity to prescribe the world that we think is necessary to both harness the opportunities presented by AI and all technologies, as well as mitigate the risks and potential harms. And of course, what's interesting so far amongst the questions that have been submitted as part of Slido is there does seem to be a shared belief in the audience that at some point AI will reach consciousness. So maybe we'll start there as a status update. Ian, should we fear the rise of AI and some godlike entity otherwise known as the singularity that may risk our existential state here on this planet? I think we should, if you have a lot of spare time on your hands. Um, actually, I don't, I don't think that that is where we should be placing our focus. I think there are so many issues in the here and now that affect people immediately that we don't have to think about what the future will be like in 50 years and wonder whether there will be a singularity in, in, in that sense. Not at all. Now, Idra, from your perspective as someone who I think is excited about the technology and really sees the potential social benefit that it can do, where do you think we're at right here and right now as a society? Yeah, it's Huda. Thank you. Um, the, I subscribe to the Steve Kay's methodology of three waves of technology. Uh, it's a short read if you guys haven't read it. And he talks about first, second, third waves. Uh, and in the third wave, which we're really in and approaching according to him, and I agree, uh, this is when a lot of the technology that's been used in, um, in sort of less real circumstances uh, is now being applied to real problems. Um, so problems of healthcare, problems of finance, which is really interesting because I think a large uh, dichotomy between the present generation and maybe the one before has been, um, you know, yeah, cool, you work and play with technology, when are you going to give me something more than just targeted ads everywhere? Uh, and I think now we're starting to see AI actually be applied to real use cases, and it's exciting. I think it's nerve-wracking, but it's also exciting. Now, Regina, I think sometimes the excitement tends to trump ethics and morality. That we get so excited by what's possible, so seduced by the potential empowerment, that we don't always ask the questions of, well, what if? Or what about the side effects or consequences? What's your status update in terms of where we are with a particular lens on the moral or ethical dimensions of this very exciting and empowering technology? 
Yeah, I think that's a good set of worries to raise. So uh, what I'm thinking about, especially right now, is the way that our interaction with AI, even, even the emerging forms we already have, relatively simple forms, affect the way we think about ourselves. So if you think about as a very classic distinction and thinking about the difference between persons and objects we interact with in the world, persons ourselves, they have inner lives, it's not okay to treat them like tools and objects. It is okay right now to treat AI that way. AI is not yet, maybe it never be, we, we can have that discussion, but it's definitely not right now a self or a person, but we're starting to interact with AI in context when we normally interact with people. So think about like when you're on a website, an e-commerce website, and a little box pops up in the corner and it claims to be a customer service agent with such and such a name, and they want to ask if you have any questions, and that's generally not a person at first, that's a bot at first. And then if you ask anything complicated, it gets handed over to some person at some customer service center. But there's this transition there, a smooth transition between interacting with the chat bot and interacting with an actual person. And so the worry I have is that we're getting used to interacting in social spaces with people whose status, or people, things whose status as persons or machines is ambiguous to us. We actually don't know. And so the worry I have is that this attitude we have towards, uh, towards AI as a tool, a thing that it's okay to treat poorly because it's not a person, is going to start spilling over into the way we interact with actual people through the internet. And I, I don't think we've, we've grappled with that very well. So that's, the, the, from the short term, that's my big worry. Ian, you wanted to? Yeah, well, I think that, that, that's an important point that can be expanded upon in, in other ways as well. So rather than focusing on, on the AI itself and how to treat it, or the spill-off effects for how we will treat people if we treat AIs in particular ways, I think we should also be aware of the idea that really what's happening and what's so exciting with some of the applications we're seeing is that our current AI, not the AI five years from now or 15 years from now, but our current AI is really blurring the distinction, the traditional distinction between instrument and actor. So there's a really meaningful sense in which we can talk about data-driven agency and that these machines have a kind of agency. And that confuses, I think, both ethics and the law in terms of our traditional categories for how we treat these things and how we think about responsibility, liability, and a, and a range of things like that. Well, and, and I definitely want to bring the conversation later to the notion of robot criminals and how we treat robot criminals under the law. But, Stephen, I'm interested in, in the work you do in part because you're really trying to empower companies and empower organizations to really reap the benefits of this technology, which, you know, for Canada in a competitive landscape, I think is a really crucial time, given that we have all this recognition for our research, but the task is to actually implement it in organizations. So what are you seeing, both in this notion of a status update, but also like the concerns and, expre and, and, and issues expressed by the clients you're dealing with and sort of what you're wrestling with to help them understand what's possible? I think, so the mission of our company is to build a better future for people and businesses. And we think that AI is a, is a really powerful technology to be able to get there. I, I think one of the challenges in AI um, is it, it's just tremendously complicated to understand. Like it's really sophisticated, uh, it's a really sophisticated topic. And I, I think if you look at the broader technical landscape right now, I think we've seen, you know, if I tie this back to, to general kind of status update, you know, you've got, I think almost 4 billion people on the internet now. You've got um, 5 billion people globally with cell phones, you know, and that has all happened really in the last 25 years. And so we've seen that you can get these technologies to scale really quickly and now all of a sudden you're connecting the world. Um, the challenge with the new set of technologies, so if you think about what's hot that a lot of people are talking about right now, so like AI and machine learning, um, blockchain, uh, quantum computing, they're really sophisticated. They're, they're difficult for the average person to get a, like a mental model or framework around because of how complex it is. And until we abstract some of that complexity away, I think it's difficult to have like a town hall conversation about if things are like great uh, or not in the future when you don't really have an understanding of like how the technology is working. Uh, so it seems very black boxy to a lot of folks right now. And, and in some ways that's actually a good description of machine learning because um, it is actually a black box in some cases. Um, but, but the thing that I think enterprises are struggling with is that they, they don't fundamentally understand the risk. And I think a lot of enterprise works off risk. So they want to understand where the risk is and then mitigate that risk at the same time as trying to drive shareholder value. And I think what we've seen in the media now is if you get it wrong, 
there's huge repercussions, you know, and there's a lot of really interesting ethical privacy security concerns that come along with this. And I think that when people hear those words, they're just like more apt to pull back completely, even if the benefit is very obvious and there's like a direct path to getting it. And so a lot of what we're spending time on now is just making sure that like we're educating people on where the risks are such that you can still take advantage and take steps in that direction so we can capitalize on it as an economy in Canada. Um, but not fall prey to maybe some of the areas where there is real risk that we need to just have more kind of public discourse on. Well, and I think the perceived risk, uh, certainly amongst the public, is privacy. And it's certainly the, the number one question so far on the system. And, you know, Huda, you work in the realm of patient health information and patient health records. So obviously privacy is something that's central to the way you work. So I'm curious, you know, as a twofold, to what extent do you think privacy is resolvable and addressable in this context? And what is the current status of privacy in society insofar are people overly concerned? Or should we, yes, be really concerned and really adamant that we don't screw this privacy thing up and ensure that it's preserved as we move forward into this environment? Yeah, no, that's a good point. We hear obviously a lot about privacy. There's really no other data set outside of your own health information that is more private. Um, so we get that a lot, as we should. I think we've actually become quite relaxed around privacy, so we give away a lot of our information for access to an app, to like get more tokens to play whatever game. Um, and I think all these, what we're creating unknowingly is these oligopolies of uh, data hoarding companies that know everything about us. But we don't even know that they know it about us. So a big reason Dot Health even exists is to be able to give that control to the individual so that they can basically use their own data, in our case, personal health data, uh, and maybe some of the other cases, they, it could be their financial data, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but to use it as a currency. So use it to get the best care possible. You could use it to maybe donate it to research. But the, the, the point is to actually give it to you versus where it lives right now, which is it lives in these isolated uh, databases at the government level, provincial level, um, at the hospital level, at any care provider level. Um, it lives everywhere except with the person whose data it actually is. Um, so I think those, uh, I would love to see people get more I think just more knowledgeable about mm -hmm. where their data is living and how they can control it. Mm -hmm. Now, it would be easy for me to go to Ian on that, but I'm gonna hold off on a sec before the legal, because I think the moral is a key part of that, mm -hmm. both in terms of, you know, we now all have access to technology that can violate anyone's privacy if we so desire, mm -hmm. and, you know, both whether it's the camera and the phone, whether it's the distribution networks on social media, the, the power to act immorally or unethically is uh, really quite accessible. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the natural question would be the legal framework, but before we get there, do we have the right moral framework in our current sort of relationship to technology to deal with these powerful tools without running into the risks that you know, often happen, especially in a gotcha environment in which the media is absolutely gonna jump on a social media mistake or an instance in which someone used these powerful tools in an immoral or unethical way. John? So a lot of what goes into these kinds of ethical norms is negotiable, and it changes over time. If you think about what sort of um, topics you could discuss in public with, uh, with strangers um, at dinner or in a large crowd, that was different in the 1950s than it is today. The sort of things that are considered off limits to talk about change over time. And what we're looking at, I think it's especially interesting, is that the development of social media, um, and algorithmic access to people's information, all of that is evolving, it's co-evolving with new norms. So just go back 20 years as far as what sort of thing you'd expect to have other people post about you on the internet. It's definitely changed since then, it's already changing and it's being driven to a large extent, I think generationally. So people who grew up from the beginning with uh, internet-enabled phones from the beginning of their, of their adulthood um, and you know, are now used to just expecting that whatever they did last night is always going to be online. So that affects people's expectations, which in turn affect what counts as violating their expectations, which means we're just kind of revising it. So I don't think there's a stable thing we can point at and say that is right now what we think about ethics and AI is going to change it in the following way. We're actually, there is this kind of feedback from the technology. So I, unfortunately, that's not a very like, 
nicely wrapped up answer, but I think it's really unstable and contentious. But it speaks to how our morality is now kind of a black box, where we're sort of exploring it through inputs and outputs, but not necessarily knowing how society is responding. Yeah, no, that, that's right. And, but it also makes it hard. Uh, you see this a lot. I, I wish I could think of an example of top of my head, but I'm sure everybody's familiar with something in their social media feed where somebody shared something about somebody and then somebody else said, you shouldn't have done that. And the first person says, that was fine. It's not agreed upon. There's not a common standard right now for what sorts of things are, are private and what sorts of things aren't. And, and, and it's really publicly negotiable. Ian? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think that... Um, a lot of what we've just talked about is true, which is to say that the norms are, are still developing uh, in a kind of way. But I think it's important to lay an anchor uh, uh, in the soil here. And, and just, I want to be really clear, there's a tendency and a rhetoric around, uh, I'll call it, blaming the stupid user. So it's the user who is now relaxed. And I'm not, I'm not picking on Yehuda for, for that. You use the term to say we're becoming to some extent, more relaxed about the way we deal with privacy. But the idea is that, that that's on the user and not paying much attention to what's happening, often on the corporate side, where there's a tension because uh, corporations have realized how valuable this data is, especially when thinking about it in the context of AI applications. But I, I, I just think it's always important to point out, and, and, and young people are usually the ones who are picked on in this respect, they don't care about their privacy. They'll, they'll sell their privacy in exchange for an Instagram post, you know, whatever. Um, but, but I've seen over the years in, in my research um, that that's not actually the case. And if I can just share one anecdote with you. Um, when Facebook was in its infancy, uh, by which I mean it was only available at that point to, 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 to college uh, students, I got all of Canada's privacy commissioners together to have a panel about Facebook. Uh, and none of them had been on Facebook. And so I, I had a research assistant spend the whole summer getting them on Facebook and getting them to use Facebook because they were saying, oh, you want to know about Facebook? Read our FAQ. And I'm like, well, have you been on Facebook? So we had this panel, and what I didn't tell them was that there was actually going to be two panels back to back. First, the commissioners talking about my summer on Facebook, and then a panel of 12 to 17-year-olds um, who were talking about their experiences on Facebook. And I distinctly remember the Privacy Commissioner of Alberta saying to one 12-year-old, well, don't you realize that when you post something on Facebook, when you sign on to Facebook, you've agreed that all of the copyright and everything you say belongs to this corporation? And the 12-year-old responded, I think, quite appropriately by saying, you know, the privacy that I'm concerned about is the privacy of my parents overhearing the messages. I need a medium of communication with my parents. So it's not that they didn't care about privacy, it's where the salience was for them. And another student, just to finish off the point, um, was asked why, why he signed on to social media. And, and he expressed that the reason he signed on was because he knew if he didn't, some of his classmates would spoof an account of him. And this was the way to protect his identity. So some fairly sophisticated views about privacy that I don't think are people just being relaxed about the medium. And I just think it's important to keep that point as part of the conversation uh, and, and recognize that the norms are shifting, but it's not that privacy is dead or gone. Well, and, and let's use that then to pivot towards our second theme of the night, which is, you know, what is the future if all things remain the same? And, and I would present the hypothesis that you know, there is this one notion that maybe government no longer has the powers it once had. And further, as we saw with Rob Ford, or we see with the President of the United States, we're electing incompetent people who could not do policy if they wanted to. <laughs> so it's not that ludicrous to suggest that things might stay as they are without any substantive government intervention. <laughs> so what does that mean? If, if, if we all decide to just let things happen as they are, in the way that much of this technology has emerged through happenstance and inspiration and accident, what do you see our future, whether 5, 10, 25 years in the future, whether utopian or dystopian, as a setup to then our next exercise of how do we respond to that? And this is where I'll remind the audience that I am encouraging my panel to say things that they do not necessarily believe in. So this is not the future you desire. This is just a future that you think you would like to share with this audience so that we can get a sense of what will happen if we do nothing when it comes to addressing some of the opportunities or some of the challenges that present us in terms of our future. So anyone who would like to volunteer to go first to take us into our own episode of Black Mirror? <laughs> or perhaps the positive equivalent thereof? 
Uh, Una, Stephen? I think, um, I think it's, you know, one of the things that always comes up is the type of data that you're feeding plus a black box where you don't actually know what it's doing with it is, just, is Black Mirror. Um, so the data that we've collected so far has some or a collection of biases of a number of different people. And these are racist in nature, they're sexist in nature, they have all kinds of inherent biases. Um, and we're feeding this black box, this data, and sometimes, many times, in early AI history, um, the algorithms or the AI has then come back and it is, it is equally, if not more so, sexist and racist, just like the data that it was fed. And I think if we continue to, um, to collect data without nuanced understanding around what we're putting in and an understanding of what this technology is doing when it's spitting it back out, I think we could see ourselves increasingly living in a world that is even more um, racist and sexist and biased than it is today. I just. You know, it's interesting, I've been involved in a lot of these AI conversations recently, and I find there's a lot of focus put on the fear factor around AI, which I think is, is fair, and it's a, it's a conversation we need to have. And I do think that there are real issues to tackle there. I think like the, there is definitely some, some ethical issues and some privacy issues that we need to sort through. Um, but I, I do think there's, like a, there's a separate lens to take on it, to go and say, what is now possible that wasn't possible before? And I think what you'll see when we look out in kind of future generations, what, what has been enabled by this technology, um, and if we can get more energy focused on like, how do we take this in a positive direction versus how do we avoid it going in a negative direction? Uh, I think there's like amazing applications in healthcare. Like I, I truly believe that in the next 100 years, it, there, there's a real path to curing all disease. Um, and there is an opportunity to think differently about um, our capabilities as human beings. Um, there's an opportunity to address, I don't think that this is the likely place we go in the short term, but there's definitely an opportunity to address fairness um, and some of the issues that we're seeing with wealth inequality. Tying it back to your political stance, I would say, I think it's easy to make the argument that the reason why we've got these populist movements right now is we haven't engaged enough people in these conversations to talk about what's possible and given them the tools to kind of help us craft what the next version of the economy or what these next big industries could look like. Um, as opposed to, you know, we've gotten everybody in a room and we've scared them to death about, you know, how there's no bright future and everything is bleak and the robot's gonna kill you anyway. And I would submit, if the robot's gonna kill you anyway, like, don't worry about the robot. Like, at that point, there's not much that you're gonna be able to do. Um, <laughs> the, the more practical, like, short-term challenge, there's a great Wired article, um, that, uh, I forget the title of it, but, but the essence of it is basically the people will rise up before the robots will. And I think that's a really great way to kind of govern the discussion is what is the potential for this technology on people and how do we get the brightest minds thinking more about how do we enable that future than kind of playing not to lose and like cornering us in the penalty box such that like we cocoon and avoid a potential future where there are like tough issues to deal with. And so that, that's kind of like, I'd love the, the, the public discourse to kind of move away from the fear-mongering and more towards the potential. I mean, I would agree entirely, especially about this notion of singularity, in that I absolutely disbelieve in singularity. It, it is not only a myth, it, 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 it's, it's ludicrous to believe in terms of its basic premise. And Ian, I suspect that you sort of share a similar critique of singularity, but yet from a legal perspective, Part of what the law does is anticipate worst possible scenarios and anticipates situations of great harm. So, I mean, you know, is, is Stephen right in saying that we shouldn't fixate on these negative targets because we might end up there, but at the same time, what responsibility do we have to really think about all these scenarios and prepare or plan accordingly? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't disagree with the, the, with the claim that uh, we ought not to fear monger. I think that's absolutely true. But I don't think that the alternative to that is to accentuate the positive. Um, so if we do nothing, we will have killer robots. And killer robots are not uh, Schwarzenegger's Terminator or Skynet or anything like that. They are existing technologies which are automated to the point where robots can both sense, process, and actuate on targets and make those decisions without, without human beings' oversight or intervention. 
And I, I would suggest that if we have no regulation on that, at some point we will see robots that are used to kill where no human being is involved in the actual carrying out of the killing. I think likewise, if we do nothing, if we don't regulate uh, along these lines, we'll also see significant increasing encroachment on civil liberties through privacy, through surveillance, um, and, and through all sorts of, uh, of other kinds of monitoring techniques, uh, the likes of which we will have never seen before. So I, I, I don't know if that, I don't think that's what you were getting at, um, but I just want to say we have to be careful. We, we can't not, um, as you say, anticipate some of the potential challenges and concerns because those were two on my list of things that will happen if we do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, while, while I'm at it, I just want to say Jesse and to tell our 800 uh, new friends here. The last time Jesse and I were on a stage where we were asked to make predictions about technology in the future, I don't know if you remember this, it was front, in front of the entire bench of the Ontario Court of Appeal. And Jesse and I made a public bet, which technically I won. Um, <laughs> But, but I, never, I never collected on it. And no, it was for a pizza. What did you have for dinner tonight? <laughs> you didn't pay, pal. <laughs> you did not pay. Um, <laughs> you do remember. Very good. Um, so what we, were, what we were betting about at the time was Je Jesse, Jesse wanted to bet that Rob Ford would be reelected. Re I don't know if you remember that. And, and technically, I won the bet. But, but it was be, act of God. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> to be fair to you, actually, on the point, um, your point at the time was about the way that social media is changing the way we process knowledge and information. And as a result, I think you were pushing the line to be provocative, that, that all, all social media is good social media. And in fact, you actually sort of started with that line today. But what I would say is one of the huge risks if we do nothing um, is that we will lose um, our proximity to things like truth, evidence, causation, um, and these kinds of things, theory, as AI in particular becomes so overwhelming and powerfully good at pattern matching and at uh, correlation, where we're at the point where from an efficacy perspective, it doesn't matter what the theory is anymore because the machines are getting it right. I think that's a real worry if we do nothing about that. Regina, what's your vision of the future if, if we do nothing? So actually following on that last point, I'm not so much gonna fear monger as maybe existential dread monger. Um, so, so there's two events that I'm pretty confident will happen in the next 20 or 30 years, probably around the same time. The first is that computers will pass the Turing test. Probably most people are familiar with the Turing test. This is sort of heuristic for if a machine can convince you that you're talking to a person on the other end of the machine, then it's, well, we can say conscious or intelligent or something. Anyway, it'll, you'll be able to interact with computers which will seem like people when you're interacting with them. Uh, Chatbots are getting really good if you compare them now to where they were 15 years ago. I'm pretty confident at some point, next 20 to 30 years, some point this will happen. But when it happens, we won't care very much. We'll decide it didn't actually show very much because the computers you'll be interacting with that will do this will be your smartphone or whatever we're carrying around in 20 or 30 years instead of a smartphone, maybe something implant in our ears or something. It'll be a device you carry everywhere with you, and you'll be used to treating it like a tool, just a thing you interact with. You're not going to want to suddenly switch from treating this thing like a tool to treating it like a person with consciousness, with a self. So we're gonna feel strong pressure to sort of say, well, passing the Turing test, that doesn't show us much. It's just a really, really clever chatbot. That's all it is. The second event, which I think will happen around the same time, is coming from the other direction. So think about like predictive text analysis. Right now, if you give a, 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 an algorithm enough data, enough, about, enough writing that some person has done, it can predict pretty well some unusual idiosyncratic words or grammatical choices that person will make. Basically, you can match patterns. So imagine the following study, which I think some big data firm is one day gonna do just to show off. Imagine it keeps track of all the public tweets people have made, and then imagine the company or the group tries to predict how everybody on Twitter is gonna react to the next big news event, some big political event, a war, some big natural disaster, and so it generates a whole bunch of predictions of what people's tweet is the morning they wake up and see the big news, and then in fact, when everybody wakes up that morning and tweets, instantly they get a retweet from this, uh, from this prediction showing what was predicted, and it's like 80, 90% accurate. So suddenly, everyone's seeing that this company is able to predict exactly what they will say, or more or less exactly what they will say, how they will use language, how they will react to new situations. So we get this from both sides. The, the technology, we, it passes the Turing test, it acts more and more like people, and then at the same time, we're being treated 
based upon the prediction, based upon the data, more and more like machines, where we can read out of the black box. So that's what I was warning about, the sense of existential dread. We reach this point where, where the line between us and between the machines that are interacting with these tools will be eroded. And I, and I don't have a good answer, even I'm a philosophy professor, but I can't tell you exactly how to react to that eventuality. It's something we're gonna have to confront. But I, I think that existential dread really evokes not just kind of where we're at in that status update, but why this march into the future can't be the black box that we're currently around. So let's go into our third thing of, you know, what would you do if you could do anything? If, whether it's a public policy, whether it's an innovation, whether it's a, a, a collective social contract, what are the things we need to be thinking about moving forward so that we get the future we desire and not the future that we dread and that we ensure, for example, it's available to everyone and not necessarily a small group of Silicon Valley elite who own and control it all. So what would be the, you know, the, 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 the pitch, the, the concept, the policy? Again, I look for a volunteer, not to put any of you on the spot, but this, I think, really is the challenge for those of us who think about this stuff, as Steve said, not to focus so much on the negative, but to evoke that positive so that we create the types of solutions and the opportunities that afford. Steve? Yeah, I, you know, I, I want to build that actually off, like maybe I'll bridge from the question before to this one as well. I, I think it's important to level set a little bit in terms of the, um, the underlying trend with kind of machine learning and AI. Um, the, the easiest way to think about it is that we're moving from a world where software that, that runs the majority of our businesses and the majority of the interactions that we have with government and others is moving from um, a framework that's like deterministic to probabilistic. So deterministic meaning we script it and we put rules in and we say, when this happens, I want you to do this and then the software executes the rules. Even if you think about the most sophisticated stuff, from a math standpoint, it tends to be pretty basic arithmetic. You know, add this up, um, multiply it, divide it, and then tell me what you're gonna get at the end of it. And we're moving to a world with machine learning where everything is probabilistic. So you don't need to tell it exactly what to do. What you end up doing is you say, here's a bunch of data of something happening in the past. So here's a bunch of times where we did something, we communicated with people, and they ended up buying the product that we wanted. Or here's a bunch of times where we tried this particular drug and the, it succeeded with the person. And then what you're asking these algorithms to do is then based on all of that training, the way that like we would train as individuals to make a probabilistic guess or prediction as to what will happen in a future scenario or what will happen with that person in that scenario. Um, I think because it's probabilistic, because it's, it's um, making predictions in a place where before it never had the ability to make predictions, we ascribe it like a conscience, like we, we treat it like a person. Um, it, it's just, at this point, it is like, it's stats, it's statistics. It's just saying that this is a more likely scenario than the other. Um, but what it, what it means is that as we look forward, most of these challenges that we're talking about are not technical challenges. They're, um, they're philosophical debates. So I'll give you an example. It is easy with um, an algorithm to be able to optimize for a very clear objective function. So if you went to an algorithm and you said, I want like the financial markets, I would like the return on capital to go up, what should I do to be able to do that? It will give you, that is a measurable thing, it is a clear objective function, and it'll give you great advice on like, it'll give you great predictions on what you should do to be able to get to that outcome. So long as the training data is good and it's seen it a bunch of times. It is very difficult when the objective function is something like truth. Like, what is truth? Like, how do you define truth? Even search, which is something that we think we've got handled, right? Like, Google's got an algorithm for search. It turns out it's actually a very difficult problem. Like, what is, what is a good search result? I mean, these are usually the points when, if there is a representative of Facebook or Google at the table, I turn to them and say, how many social scientists and philosophers do you employ? And usually their answer is zero to nil. So while I agree with you, those are very important questions. Unfortunately, as a society, we're not allocating resources to those areas. So Huda, I'm, I'm interested both to, to hear your thoughts on what would you do if you could do anything, 
but I'm going to couple that with a question from the audience, which I think is relevant, which is to survive in the job market of the future, what are the most important skills an individual could have? Because I think the questions are intertwined. Right? I think we're not just talking about what do we need for the future, it's also on an individual level, what do we as individuals need to survive? And I'm asking you this in part because I think within the startup community and within that world, we are seeing some of those skills emerge, if not by need, by demand. So I'm, I'm curious if you could sort of throw those together. Yeah, I think that's a really good question around really evolving technology and the pace at which it's evolving. Uh, the one thing that I keep coming back to um, is clarity of communication and thought. So if I'm ever recruiting between two people, I will every time hire the better writer. And I think that couldn't be more applicable today and in the future when things like AI and machine learning where you are teaching um, a machine how to learn something, um, clarity of communication and the ability to get your ideas across becomes really, really important. And I think in some of our more, I guess, more desired uh, professions, so if you're going to professional school or engineering school or law school, um, those tend to be, or, uh, you know, writing or ability to communicate are considered soft skills. And I think we're going to see a huge comeback uh, of those skills because they are so important. And I think technology as an industry, we're finding ourselves in a really uh, morally and ethically corrupt place. Um, and I think a big reason behind that is the lack of humanities education and a lot of the people making the decisions. But to go back, actually, to the, the future, what I would do, um, Ian brought up uh, a point about, you know, where I feel like in this conversation we've equated doing something with applying regulation. And I want us to move away from that as a whole. Just as this uh, discussion sort of globally, I feel like those are the two um, polarizing points is, how much should government be involved? I want to move the conversation more towards um, what can we do, what best practices um, can we employ, what teams can we build, what can we agree on are good principles when we're building a lot of these technologies. So if Steve and I and other entrepreneurs are putting together teams that are going to build the AI of the future that is going to determine if you get diagnosed three months earlier or on the day of um, a, a, a stage four cancer diagnosis, you would want the team that is, that is building it to be empathetic, to be representative of who you are. And that doesn't require government. I think government can be a forcing function, really a last resort I would like to use it as, because I think there is a lot of um, innovation and great thought and discussion that happens in private markets, in, uh, in industry, and in research and academia that really, by the time it gets to government and, you know, Policymakers will wrap their heads around, don't at me if you're a policymaker sitting in this crowd. Um, it, you know, often policy, as soon as it's put in place, will become outdated because industry or technology is outpacing um, how quickly you can develop something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for us, I mean, I, I, I think we have a really um, interesting and exciting future um, in AI and machine learning and a lot of the other technologies that we're looking at. And, you know, I mean, regulation by government or otherwise isn't necessary. Well, can, and can, it I also, can I jump in? One sec. Sure. It, it also sounds that the other answer you gave is the other skill that humans need is, is the joy of learning. Right? The ability to learn so that you can keep up, which is what I heard in terms of your communication. That's a beautiful your way of putting it. Now, Ian has the California ideology won. Has, you know, libertarianism become the uh, assumption that we all have for how to address these issues? Or is there still a role for law and government? Uh, uh, what is your thought on what we should do in moving forward? Why are you leaning on my law credential? Um, <laughs> I want, I want to actually back up for a second. I'll, 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 I'll get, so there's, there's a neat trope that Larry Lessig introduced uh, more than a decade ago, almost 20 years ago now, where he talked about the difference between East Coast code and West Coast code. So East Coast code referred to what the, what the regulators were doing in Washington, whereas West Coast code um, talked about what the software people were building in Silicon Valley. And, and in fact, underlying both of those sets of code, if you will, are more fundamental values. And what I was going to say to Huda was, I'm willing to trade off uh, talking about regulation as being on the other pole, which actually isn't, isn't my interest in, in um, 
promulgating as a point of view, um, if you're willing to maybe hold back a little bit on best practices languages. Um, the language that I would use rather than best practices or regulation um, is in fact values, uh, fundamental values. And I think it's really important to sort of unpack what values are and how they change uh, with technology. So I'll, I'll give an example, um, talking a little bit about uh, Steve's, Steve's discussion before about search engines, right? So you said, you know, how do we make a value alignment such that a machine can understand what truth is, I think is, was your example. And I guess what I would say is like, we have to remember that technology renders many of our values invisible and it, and it actually obfuscates them in a kind of way. If you ask me, I would say that search has never been about truth. Search has been about stroking people's preferences. Uh, and the idea that you want to, Google's whole modus operandi from the beginning was to be able to anticipate what people would want and serve it up to them without them necessarily even knowing that that's what they're doing. And in that respect, I think that in addition to the power that prediction um, the power of prediction that comes with good AI, um, I think we have to think about preemption, uh, which comes with prediction, which is very much what, what is happening to us. We don't even realize the various things that we're preempted from doing because the prediction often is put out there in a way that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll just quickly end uh, the remark by saying, if you were going to ask me what's the value I think we need to go back to um, underlying all of these kinds of technologies, including the health examples that you talked about, Huda, I would say the Greek value known as eudaimonia, um, which sometimes translates as happiness, but it's not happiness in the sense of stroking people's preferences. It's happiness more in the sense of a kind of well-being. And I am very much in favor of technologies, the goal of which is to promote human well-being and human flourishing. That's what it should be all about. Mm -hmm. Now, Regina, I, I want you to both sort of play upon what Ian was saying about values and tie it back to something you said earlier in which we're not really on the same page when it comes to those values and when it comes to what we see as acceptable with regard to the use of this computer. So my two-part question to you is both what would you like to see? What is the, the change or the initiative that you think is necessary for a future? And as a second part, what's it going to take for us to either renew our social contract or at least have a space in which that social contract can be discussed without us all retreating to our own tribes and retreating to our own systems of faith rather than doing the messy work of finding that common platform for society? Yeah, so, so one of the big worries I have right now is exactly on this point, that we're having difficulty engaging in public discourse and in political democratic debate with strangers online because we're beginning to be suspicious of people in a particular way. So in, in recent political events, in the Brexit referendum in the UK, in the US 2016 presidential election, it, it's clear that someone was interfering in public, in public discussion via, um, in some cases, uh, people under sock puppet identities, but also in some cases just chatbots just algorithmic programs that were designed to intervene in debates and stir up trouble, present information in the least charitable way to make people angry and mad at each other and just be divisive. Not any particular end in mind, just get people mad and not able to talk to each other. And of course there's speculation this was done by, by Russian intelligence. I'm not a security analyst, I can't tell you who did it. But what I, what's important is that a lot of people believe that's exactly how it happened. And if you look now, right now, in public discourse on the internet, a lot of times when people disagree with each other very quickly, somebody jumps in and says, don't argue with them, they're a chatbot, they're a Russian military chatbot, they're an intelligence bot, they're not even a person. So it used to be in public discourse and you disagreed with somebody, didn't want to engage with them, you would say they're a paid communist agent or they're engaging in bad faith or they're, they're a troll, but at least they were a person. And now that's the default response. If I don't agree with you on the internet, you're not even a human being. You're just a computer program. And so the worry is that we're unable to even have these conversations increasingly. And I think, I, I mean, I, I really don't have a really, I'm really worried about this. I think the, the, the first step that has to happen is that the platforms themselves, 
Facebook and Twitter have to take responsibility for this, being very transparent about when they can tell that something is being generated by a bot of some form, that needs to be incredibly transparent to use. It has to be flagged in an extremely clear way. No, no hiding it, no winking at it, um, no, no tolerating it to some extent to make profits. It really is incumbent on the platforms themselves to tell us when things are actually bots and they can tell that. Although it does beg the question, what if it labels me a human being a bot and does so, so authoritatively that it's difficult for me to argue? Now, you know, this is the point in the evening in which we're shifting towards your questions. So I, I want to stay with you, Regina, if only because a large number of questions have addressed this notion of personhood, right? You know, when is an AI considered a person? You know, another one was, you know, will AI be able to lie, right? Or if an AI commits a crime, but we can't track down the person who programmed the AI or who deployed the AI to commit that crime, who do we hold responsible? So it, it, it all the, I, I find this as a recurring theme, certainly in this subject, which, you know, Stephen's point of what is truth, you know, there's the larger of what is consciousness, right? Or even what is it to be a human? I'm not sure we've ever had consensus on any of those points. So I'm curious, Regina, for you to start us off. Where is this notion of AI as personhood? You know, what, will there be criteria? Should there be criteria beyond just the Turing test, which you mentioned earlier, that really frames our relationship with these systems and in theory then our relationships with each other since we're communicating with each other through these systems? So my, my first response to this is maybe, maybe the most contentious or disappointing thing I could say, which is that there are no new questions here. We, we've kind of had this problem for a long time. Think about how we think about animals. And we have questions about which animals or what kinds of animals or if any animals at all are conscious or able to understand or have uh, feelings. People's attitudes have changed tremendously about this just in the last 10, 15 years. So I think that the fundamental questions we're getting at are the same kind of questions. The one extra complication here is that we did not create animals. If, uh, to the extent that animals are conscious and are aware and are experiencing pain as a result of our actions, we didn't bring them into being. But if we do manage to create a kind of self-aware uh, artificial agent, then we are responsible for whatever happens to it, whatever its experiences are like. So we do have a certain baseline responsibility, existential responsibility towards AI that we don't have towards animals. Mm -hmm. Now, another theme that was recurring in the questions that have been submitted is on this notion of bias. And, and how do we mitigate bias in AI? And how do we mitigate bias in the kinds of automated systems? And this is where organizations like ProPublica and uh, Virginia Eubanks has a, a new book out this week called Automating Inequality, where she talks about the digital poorhouse and the way in which welfare systems in the United States, when automated, are actually making it harder for people to climb out of poverty. So what are the means that we could use to ensure that these systems do not carry forward some of the biases of the old system, but actually achieve the kind of empirical or evidence-based decision-making that we aspire them to have? I think there's a couple, there's a lot of research going on in this space right now. I, I think one of the main issues, probably from a public standpoint, is, is just the acknowledgement of like how bias happens in machine learning. I think there's, there's a general belief um, when you think about machines making the decision that bias wouldn't be introduced. This is actually a bias-free place because it's just a machine making a logical decision. The, the challenge, um, just to understand where the bias comes from, is that all it's doing is, is making a prediction based on whatever training data you fed it. So imagine you're a bank and you've got 100 years of information on, on who you gave loans to. And it turns out that over those 100 years, there was some discrimination in, in the way that you had given out the loans. And so you, had, um, you, you, were, you were woefully underrepresented in terms of people that deserved a loan that were of um, you know, a particular uh, racial background or uh, gender. Um, that bias, if the system is training on it, will persist in the way it makes decisions moving forward because it's just trying to predict what a human would have done with all of the, inf the collective information that it's been given. And so, so first I think is an acknowledgement that that's how bias gets created and most data sets are biased in one way or another um, that maps to the bias that naturally existed in the time when those decisions were made. And um, there are not 
there, there are a bunch of different techniques that people are working on right now to try to drive to fairness. So acknowledge, try to acknowledge where you think the bias is coming from in the data set and then adjust for that in the algorithm. But the challenge becomes, can you properly identify the bias and what levels of bias are you looking at? Because some of them are easier and we talk about them a lot, like you know, potentially gender bias might be an easier one to pull out and you've got the data and you might be able to address that. But there might be some interesting, like, I don't know, ageism or something, and you hadn't even thought to look for it, and therefore, like, you haven't tuned the algorithm for it, and then it persists in kind of the new model, and you create a different bias in your model. And so I think it's, a, again, a complicated topic, but one that um, I would love to see more of the AI conversations go towards as opposed to the killer robots. And I totally agree with Ian's point before, weaponizing a technology should absolutely be something that can be regulated, that we should get everybody on board. We None of us... Nobody in the industry wants to see that happen. But I do think that the human toll, like if you look at the total human toll, like how many lives will be ruined, bias in the algorithms way exceeds like drones coming in shooting people in, in, in terms of like practical implications to society. Although let, let's use that as a moment to pivot back in that the phrase, the weaponization of social media is kind of a catch-all that describes this fake news stuff. And, you know, Facebook right now, in, in advance of the Ontario election, in advance in the Canadian federal election, is really trying to work with, you know, academic partners, public policy partners, to mitigate the weaponization of social media. But to what extent is that not only a real thing, but a threat to our demo democratic process? Because, you know, fake news is in the eye of the beholder. If the President of the United States is calling CNN fake news, and if, you know, the, the uh, I've, I've spent time watching Russia today, they often do say stuff that needs to be said. So, you know, where is that line and to what extent can we, you know, well, there's bias in terms of the algorithms, but then there's ideological bias or the bias in terms of Facebook not wanting to take responsibility even though they have a lot of responsibility in the way that these things are formed. I'm looking to the academic side of the panel for uh, a response in this regard. Um, well, first of all, I think you're right to recognize that bias uh, is the result of many different sources. I think the story uh, that, or, the, or the lesson that we learned from Tay, the Microsoft chatbot, which was referred to earlier, um, showed that bias is sometimes just a reflection of the way that machines learn things from humans. And when humans are biased and racist and sexist, so too will the bots be, unless we do something about it, like, like train them in a different way than people thought we had to train them when that experiment came out. Um, the, 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 the part around, uh, Jesse, you're trying to shift the conversation a little bit more around um, the intentional um, injection of bias into a system. Um, but I want to just, for, for a moment, just return uh, briefly to Steve's point about how, how we deal with um, bias in machine learning. And to make a more basic point that I think people should be sort of focused on, if you, if you hadn't thought much about some of these issues, let's say, for example, before you came here tonight, and that is that what machine learning is trying to do is to take a whole bunch of data and to treat certain bits of data as proxies for something else. So one thing stands for another, and the machine makes an inference based on what the proxies are held out to be. So often, uh, it's about the way in which we designate the meaning or, or we align the values of that machine to understand the proxies as meaning a particular thing. And from my understanding of things, that's a non-trivial set of problems. And that's why there's an entire field uh, that has developed with conferences. They have funny names. It's called FATML, F-A-T, which stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency uh, in Machine Learning. But I think the, the takeaway message I'd want to leave on, on this part of the question is that um, transparency is, is, is not enough. Um, one of the things that is challenging still, and the Europeans are trying to address this in their legislation, is that some systems are in fact inscrutable. In other words, humans just can't really understand why a certain pattern of data leads to a certain correlation that leads to a certain prediction. You can't really transcribe some of those things into human terms. That's a huge challenge. Uh, but a related challenge uh, uh, to that 
uh, which is not about inscrutability, is the fact that there are many companies for whom it would be quite inconvenient and would be the difference between their profit margin if they had to spend a lot of time explaining why Waze took you down this street instead of down that street. And so those challenges uh, are, are, are difficult uh, to solve, and they're not always based on malice or intention of the other sort. So I, I, I juxtapose those for you. Now, it's interesting that we've gone an hour into discussion and nobody has yet thought of the children. Won't somebody please think of the children? And in particular, there was a story about YouTube and the way in which people were manipulating YouTube to basically trick kids into watching these different types of disturbing videos. And, you know, I think parents sort of see this anecdotally, but to what extent are children both part of the same dragnet, part of the same information system, even though the companies all say, well, no one under 13, and, no, you know, and yet I know tons of toddlers who are on YouTube and their parents have set up Facebook profiles. You know, to, to what extent are we assuming all of this is consenting adults, but there is a sizable part of the population that are interacting with these algorithms, being affected by these algorithms. Their parents may not know what best practices are, the research may not be fast enough to understand the impact on, you know, social development, brain development. So I'm, I'm curious what you guys think in terms of, like, what advice would you have for parents? Or what concerns should we have as more and more of these tools are so easy that a five-year-old could use it, but maybe the five-year-old shouldn't be using it in terms of what they might be exposed to or the power that they may have? Anyone like to address or tackle that question? Who do I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have kids. Uh, I do have nieces and nephews, and it's fascinating to see them interact with things that are not um, tech-enabled and expect them to be. It's so like my niece is like two, and when she sees a magazine, she's like trying to swipe at it because she wants it to like show her a different picture. Um, and this is, this is the world that she's growing up in. Um, and I think in, in this scenario, really the parent's role is that of a gatekeeper. I think different organizations, different uh, government structures and bodies play this role of gatekeeper in our lives to protect us from certain things. And it's pretty similar, uh, I would imagine, again, saying this from someone who's not a parent, um, that parents would be acting as gatekeepers, knowing what's going on. And really, it's about using technology and the, like, extremely fast paced, probably you can't keep up with it, um, using it as an augmentation tool rather than a replacement tool. So you're not, um, you know, replacing t quality time with your kid by, you know, like giving them an iPad instead with a bunch of YouTube videos, um, but instead augmenting it to make that a richer experience in the end. Um, and I think, you know, some, some people will always use it in certain ways, and I think they have full agency to use it in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and if they think or think it best that their five-year-old should be looking at disturbing videos on YouTube, then, then I think um, as a society, um, I don't think we can penalize them for mm -hmm. it. I want to come back to that agency point in a moment, but I think the other side to this is the education, right? You know, it's not enough to just say to parents, hey, it's all on you. Obviously, there's a pedagogic, an educational role. So I offer to the two teachers, you know, granted post-secondary education, they're not really kids, although, yeah, they kind of are. But on lower levels, in secondary and primary education, do you guys have any perspectives on what we're not doing or should be doing that really try to address the, the, tra the challenges that we're going to face moving forward? I actually, am, this is the part where I'm relatively optimistic um, in that just looking at the history of the way technology impacts people, every time there's some new wave of technology, everyone goes crazy about the poor children. So think about the 1950s and the idea that television is going to rot the brain of the, t the children in the 1950s. Think about the 1980s, video games are going to turn everyone into uh, a, a homicidal maniac. So every time there's some new wave, of, a new medium that children are interacting with, everyone gets very upset. And, but what, what's clear from this, I think if you look back at the history, is that people attend to the wrong dangers. 
They're just not even aware of whatever there is in the problem. So this thing about like cable television, people worried about so many channels on cable TV. What they didn't worry about was the way it would affect political polarization. The way that fast forward 20 years and you get into these little information silos that are then replicated on the internet where people are just listening to people with their own view and nothing else. It took a long time for people to notice that that was the real danger of cable television and now it's a truism of talking about this kind of media. But it wasn't there at the beginning. So whatever is the problem, so maybe this is not so optimistic, whatever is the problem, <laughs> Right now, with kids and screens and social media, we're probably not going to be able to detect it. It won't be really clear until those kids themselves are growing up and looking back on it. So, I don't know. Yeah, I actually, that wasn't that optimistic. Well, <laughs> and, and I think both sort of, you're citing the historical uh, mania that comes with every new technology. And, and Huda, your point about agency ties to another recurring theme in the questions we've received tonight. You know, and, and part of it addresses this singularity notion. And to be clear, where I don't believe in singularity, I do believe in the Wizard of Oz. So I do believe that what we should fear is the guy behind the curtain who doesn't want us to look at him and instead presents this magical AI as if it is this sentient being when in fact it's old school human manipulation. So the question that came up a lot is how do we preserve our agency? How do we preserve our autonomy? And I think on the entrepreneurial side, that is the path to prosperity, that when you empower people to think about this innovatively, to think about this entrepreneurially, that could be the future of the Canadian economy. And similarly, I think on a social side or on a, a political side, you know, we should maintain freedom of speech and freedom of thought and not have everything predicted and anticipated on us. So I'm, I'm curious for any of you, you know, what will it take for us to not just nurture, but even guarantee that people are gonna have the same level of autonomy and agency that maybe we take for granted today, but I think is really key to how this technology both develops for everyone, but also mitigates against some of the, the, the fears that we may have, because they don't really matter if we still have the autonomy and agency that we sort of currently do. Steve? Yeah, I, li I like Ian's point before around values. I, you know, we talk a lot in this country about diversity being our strength. And I, I think the one thing, and I was in the U.S. Um, through the 2016 election and, and moved back last year. And w one of the things that just became abundantly clear to me as that whole election cycle was, was playing out is that um, there, just, there just aren't enough people in the conversation and, and it's starting to shrink the, the, the powers kind of centralizing. And because of that, th there are some things that might be obvious that if you would allow more voices in and you'd give more people the tools to participate effectively in those conversations, you'd actually get to, to greater outcomes. And I think that sticking to, like that's one of the areas, like A, one of the reasons why I moved back to Canada and, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic about our, our potential in this country is that I think we naturally have an advantage in, in the sense that we're going to see more angles than, than other countries. We're going to have more diverse perspectives to bring to the table. I think the challenge is, um, A, do those voices get to the table? And B, do we listen to them when they're at the table? Because I think, um, as we've talked about a little bit today, I worry that these get codified off as a technology challenge and only a technologist with like a PhD in machine learning has the ability to solve this problem. Uh, if anything, like I think thematically for me and what, what you're hearing from everybody else here today is is everybody here has more of a right to participate in this conversation than you might have come in here thinking you do. And it's not on us to tell you how to participate in that conversation. It's you to bring your experience and your understanding of how you think the world should work, what problems we should solve, um, and, and then help us with the application of this technology such that it solves those problems and we prioritize the right values, not in reverse where we're here to dictate to you what your future is gonna look like and when the robot is gonna take over and like what you're going to then be like subservient to. Like I, I think that is a really backward way. But an unfortunate, unfortunately the way that I think I'm seeing it play out in certain countries and I think what happened in the US and what happened in the UK is just a bunch of people that got fed up with being left behind saying I just want my voice heard. Whether they wanted the outcome or not, I think is secondary. I think it's more to say like, I wanna make sure people know I'm still alive and have a perspective. Um, and and I, I don't want us to have to learn that way in, in this country and I think we've got a real opportunity to make sure that we don't. Ian? Yeah, so your question was about how do we maintain agency in the face of these technologies and I think you know it almost 
it almost sounds like a trite response, but the best way to maintain agency is to not delegate all of the important tasks and decision making to machines. One of the things that's so exciting about AI is that at least on a narrow range uh, of tasks and kinds of decision making, AIs are radically starting to outperform uh, ex human experts. Uh, one example that I've been writing about recently in a paper uh, that I'm just about to publish um, with a US scholar and a, and a Canadian machine learning expert um, is about uh, the future of medical diagnostics and what we're seeing in certain subspecialties, radiology being one of them, pathology another, that um, machines are just getting much better at tumor spotting uh, and, and doing diagnosis than human specialists. And so the question then becomes what to do about it. In this paper, we make kind of a, a strange, but I think interesting argument, which is that our current medical malpractice laws and the way that we, we um, regulate through tort law um, will actually be a driver to taking the human out of the loop as there's more pressure put on hospitals uh, to go with the decision-making system that has the best track record. So the better machines get at this, the more pressure there will be on to let the machines decide. And if I can just finish the point, um, what's, what's so uh, concerning about that? I mean, on the one hand, you're saying, well, yeah, well, if the machines are better at it, let's let them do it. But if you then contemplate an entire generation or maybe two generations of medical diagnostic decisions in a database, you start to see very quickly that the human uh, diagnostician who's left playing a role in the background um, has a very difficult time entering into that. So it says, it speaks to the threats around the future of medical epistemology, around medical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see that across the board. So to me, one of the responses about how to maintain agency is to think about how to meaningfully keep the human in the loop where necessary, not, not just because we want to have humans involved in everything, but where necessary, and how best to pair human-machine co-robotic interactions, if you will, a centaur chess as, as we speak about, um, where the human and the machine together can way outperform what a machine could do on its own or what its humans on its mm -hmm. own. We need the humans in the loop uh, in important ways to, to maintain agency. Mm -hmm. now, we are just about running out of time, and I do have one last question for the panel, but you know, Ian's points do raise that we have not today addressed the employment issue of how AI may or may not affect employment. Um, I would uh, cite for further reading the Minister of Employment in Sweden, who uh, was featured in the New York Times about a week ago saying, we don't protect jobs, but we do protect workers as a larger policy of funding education and retraining. Um, this is, of course, the last opportunity for anyone to pull an Arnold Horshack. So if there is anyone in the room who currently feels pressed to ask a question using their voice, you have about five seconds to stand up and go, oh, 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 Mr. Takata. Yes, in the back, please, and use your outdoor voice if you might. Shoot. Great question. Ian, with the brief answer. Sure. So really quickly, I want to I wanna put my cards on the table. I, I was uh, an author along with uh, um, a couple hundred people from the um, computer science and machine learning community to write a letter to Trudeau asking him uh, for Canada to take a leadership role and take a stand at the international level. Um, it, the brief answer to your question is international humanitarian law does have certain principles um, which would make it illegal, for example, for a, a weapon system that was unable to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants, um, uh, and that, that would be illegal. Of course, some people are saying, well, what happens when artificial intelligence is actually better if it becomes better at that? At which point, I think it, it sort of comes back to what is more of a moral question about, like, are we going to let these machines play Russian roulette with people's lives? Um, so, uh, the, the short answer to your question, though, which really can't be done too briefly, is that Canada 
1996 was a leader in promulgating something called the Ottawa Treaty, which was the international treaty to ban landmines. And while it's an imperfect system to be sure, and while there are countries like the US who haven't even signed on to it, um, it's also the case that there's international pressure and therefore international norms to say, hey, this isn't the right thing to be doing. And so I think the people who are seeking uh, a, a treaty that would preemptively ban autonomous weapons, of which I am among uh, those signatories, um, what we believe is that you need to have some kind of a stated norm in order to then be able to try to say to countries and put pressure on them that they shouldn't be doing it. Now, what I find fascinating about that question is it illustrates how almost each issue we've raised tonight could be discussed in great detail in a very fascinating, publicly accessible way that I think needs to happen. So my last question, which I'll ask to each of you on the panel, and I'm indirectly asking all of you here in the audience, how do we expand this conversation? How do we get more people involved in this conversation? How do we allow this conversation to grow in depth and diversity so that we can, as a society, address all the complicated things that we've brought up so I ask each of you, very briefly, what will you do, personally or professionally, to carry this conversation forward so that more people are involved and that more of it gets really thought through and discussed and debated amongst society as a whole? I, I've always been throwing to Stephen, so I will do the opposite and throw to Regina first in terms of, you know, what do you pledge or what do you want to do to see this conversation grow and be more inclusive? So I think the best way to get people involved is for people to see concretely how they've already been affected by things like this. So a good example of this is something Facebook did recently, which I think it was only in the States, but it was to show people which stories they viewed in the last couple of years had been paid for by someone in Russia. So basically, like, you saw this before, you viewed it, we have a data on this, we tracked that you viewed it, and we now know this was paid for out of, out of some sort of um, psychological operation. So that got people thinking and talking, right? I personally was affected by this. So I think it's cases like that where the platforms, where, where Facebook and Twitter have the, have the information, they, they, they have the data, they can do this to flag for us. We know that such and such a thing happened and affected you personally. That gets people thinking and talking. Ian? Yeah, so I think the first thing we do is we subcontract with Jane and we consult with the Dean of Engineering on how you get this many people to a public event. I think there needs to be more public events. I, I think... Yeah. I, I think the venue is definitely part of it, but... Absolutely. Um, uh, but, but I think we need more public events like this. We need these events to be available after the fact online to anybody who wants to watch them. Um, and, and so I think that's an important thing uh, to be doing. Uh, you asked me to make a pledge, uh, controversial to make people uh, make a pledge on a stage, um, but um, the, the, the pledge that I will make is that uh, actually, or the answer to the question is what, what is it that I'm doing? I also agree that we have to meet people outside of the rarefied halls uh, of academic office hours and classrooms because I think if we had this event at York University, as I was saying to the dean before, we would have had 40 people show up, right? Um, but, but, but one of the things that I'm doing is I'm actually writing a graphic novel um, on these kinds of issues it's called A Planet of Playthings and I'm um, working with a very talented artist. And the goal is to, to recognize that the generation that I want to speak to about these issues has to be met on its own turf. And that means we have to translate knowledge out of academic speak, out of business speak, um, and into uh, a language that makes people want to sit for an hour and a half and listen to four talking heads uh, prompted by a fifth uh, talk about these kind of things. <laughs> Right on. Huda? Yeah, I think a lot of this is around uh, giving people permission to get involved in this conversation. And I think a lot of the times we will unwittingly uh, block people out of conversations by maybe only presenting academics and industry people. So only founders of companies and people who work in academia are talking about this. When really what, we, what, what I would love to see is more uh, discussion with people who maybe are not coming from backgrounds that you would expect when you think about AI. Um, and I think part of, uh, part of my personal 
uh, mission in really all the things that I do is to bring more representation in everything that we're building, in every room that we're, um, that we're speaking in, and to ask the question, who's missing? And I think when it comes to artificial intelligence, that is the most important question that we have to ask as organizers of events, as participants, um, as people putting them together, um, we need to be asking, who are we missing? Who couldn't come to downtown Toronto because they weren't able to? What is the equity and accessibility around it? And I think a lot of us can be having these conversations in circles that aren't specifically for AI, uh, but talking about it from a social perspective, which I think could take us really far. Right on. Steve? Yeah, I think there's two, there's two things that I like to focus on that I, I, I hope will make a difference on this front. I, I completely agree. I, I think inclusion is number one, just giving everybody the confidence to participate in, in these topics and understand that um, the complexity can be abstracted away. A lot of these are human issues. They're not technology issues. And so you should, you should have the confidence to participate just like any other human being does um, and express your opinions. And, and I do think the breakthroughs will come largely from more of our kind of humanity side than our, than our engineering or technical side. Um, small piece on that, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Hinton, who, who a lot of you might have heard of, is kind of like the godfather of modern AI, uh, was a professor here at University of Toronto for a, a long time and um, now is chief scientist at the Vector Institute of AI here and, and works for Google. Um, never took a computer science course. He's, um, he's a cognitive psychology PhD, um, very much a humanities thinker that brought his kind of unique view of, of, of people um, into a very math-dominated field and, and now is seen as the, the kind of um, the person that's brought us into this next generation of, of AI. So I, if he can do it, um, you know, people in this room can definitely take a step in that direction. The other piece... Um, and this, this is going to sound um, potentially uh, the capitalist in me might be coming out, but um, I want to build a global leading business here that can hire a lot of people and can be known, can, can put Canada on the map for the, the, econ like the commercial application of this technology such that we can benefit economically from a lot of the investments that are being made. Um, we are winning, just so everybody understands, we have the best researchers in the world in AI. We are... Um, the, we are well acknowledged as the global leader in AI research. And we are likely not to win economically from that if we don't get more big companies commercializing that technology. And so uh, I'm hoping that Huda, I, and, and others in this community build these next generation Facebooks and IBMs and other big companies uh, so that we actually can can benefit and, and our next generation can prosper and, and not have to move out of this country to be able to do that. And I look forward to taking your sponsorship money when we run events on this particular <laughs> subject. Now, I would also just like to say that all of you, to really amplify what Huda and Steve just said, would like to congratulate all of you. You've now just graduated from a York engineering event. So you've now all become experts in AI and governance, so under the principles of each one teach one, you should now go back to your dinner table, to your community, to your social environment, and host discussions just like this. Because you're all now experts that you all use algorithms every day. You've now taken a class here in discussing some of the critical issues, some of the research questions, some of the challenges. So not only should you go back to your dinner table in your community and have these conversations, but then publish them. Then share them. Then tell the world the conclusions that you've come out to because that is democracy insofar as the government doesn't really care about these issues as far as I can tell. So it's for us to care about these issues and mobilize a broader dialogue that, as Huda mentioned, really acknowledges who's not here and then tries to facilitate a larger discussion. With that said, I encourage all of you to keep using the hashtag that we've been using tonight to continue this conversation forward with people who are here and who are interested. And I certainly encourage people to uh, uh, address these issues with the authority and expertise that someone who would believe that they have that authority and expertise does, because you now do have that authority and expertise. So thank you very much. It was kind of you to give up an evening and have what is, I think, a very relevant and interesting discussion. And I look forward to receiving an invite to the event that you're holding that discusses this particular event. I would love to attend. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.